our spine to support our weight. So standing is great, walking is great, you can use some weights, you can do yoga, which is flexibility exercise, you can do anything. You can sit in a ball in front of your desk at work, you're using your muscles to kind of balance yourself. So it really makes a big difference, but you don't have to do this intense type of exercise and feel that if you're not, you're not getting any benefit. And you may even be hurting your joints, like you said. Next. Um, uh, again, exercise, I said, Monica. So just to finish up the, the, the 10, because again, I'm not going to be here all day. Um, lipids and lipoproteins, again, one of my interests and one of the things that really brought a lot of this, this, this nutrition message together. And you'll be seeing this more and more. It's starting to come out in the main press. Um, the amount of cholesterol in our blood is irrelevant. It's how the cholesterol travels. Cholesterol is a fatty substance. Triglycerides are, in fact, fats. These are essential for bodily function. The blood is water. Fat and water don't mix. So cholesterol and triglycerides are packaged together in what are called lipoprotein particles. These particles travel around the blood, and they deposit the cholesterol and fat. And it's actually the amount of particles we have that determines the risk. Why is this relevant? The more particles, the worse. Fat in the diet does not affect the particle number. Carbohydrates promote more particles. So the carbohydrate message actually involves cholesterol and fat as well when we have this metabolism. Blood pressure of paramount importance. Uh, healthy blood sugar, again, we're talking about the diabetes. Vitamin D, a lot of buzz about vitamin D. I'm sure many of you have had vitamin D checked recently. It comes from the sun. Uh, it's associated with this metabolic cluster we talked about. Not sure if it's a cause or effect. Cheap and safe to replace. Take your freaking vitamin D. Uh, Omega-3s, again, I think you should have diets high in omega-3 fish. A lot of misconceptions about that. The North Atlantic fatty fish are what you want. Tilapia, uh, dolphin, no omega-3s. The reason is omega-3s have very high boiling points, so uh, uh, very um, uh, low melting points. So they stay liquid in cold environments. If we had saturated fat, which is not bad for us, but if you have a cold water fish with saturated fat that's floating around in 40 degree weather, the saturated fat solidifies, <laughs> the fish pops to the ground. So omega-3s stay liquid in cold temperatures, which is why they're very beneficial and why you find them in cold water fish. Um, Farm-raised salmon is a wonderful source of omega-3, big misconception. Salmon will not eat fish, will not eat grain, they eat fish parts. So they're eating fish that have omega-3s. Farm-raised tilapia, no omega-3, because they get fed corn, which is no omega-3. Mm -hmm. so, so remember, what you're eating, you're eating what that thing ate. So that's the concept of grass-fed beef, for example. They graze in grass, which has omega-3s. The farm, the, you know, the big uh, cattle ranch, the cattle farms, they're fed corn, no omega-3s. So even our beef could be a great source of omega-3 if you get from the right source. And the inflammatory diseases, this is true. This was, we've noticed this gingivitis, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. These are things that we started seeing a couple of years ago, higher vascular disease and diabetic rates in these people over time. And it's the same underlying inflammatory process. So I'm wrapping it up. Um, so this is what we want to avoid, the gingivitis, rheumatoid arthritis, psoriasis. That's an aorta that doesn't look too good. So they're all related. Don't ignore these concepts. And again, I've tried to work with the rheumatologist to say, if you've got a patient with advanced rheumatoid arthritis, if you have a patient with, you know, Send them our way. Let's make sure the cholesterol is under control. Let's decrease whatever we can. Don't look at the person as a si the disease is a silo. I have rheumatoid arthritis. I need this pill. Okay. And what is rheumatoid arthritis associated with? Let's look at them as clusters of abnormalities, not an individual abnormality. Um, no quick fix. No pill. No vitamin. No magic. You know powder you're going to put in your food. Um, it's not fixed by surgery procedures. If you've got advanced vascular disease, if you get a bypass, you get a stent, you've done nothing to correct the underlying disease process. You've opened the artery, perhaps prevented a, a catastrophic event, but the underlying process is there. We get that all the time. Oh, they fixed it, they put a stent in it. Oh yeah, you're still smoking, you're still taking, you know, you're taking a cholesterol pill, etc. So there's no quick fix. Um, it does worsen over time. It starts early in age, 20s, 30s, that's when we're starting to see abnormalities. Last point I want to make is um, they've done these great studies. Uh, they started in the Korean War, and then they did them recently in Alabama, where they took people killed from the age of 3 to 60 and did autopsies of everyone, you know, car accidents, etc. Uh, in the Korean War, 30% of the American soldiers had the beginnings of vascular plaquing. This is the age 19, 20, 21. Granted, a lot of them smoked. They repeated this in Bogalusa, Alabama, same thing. 20, 25, 30-year-olds, the beginnings of the vascular plaque, that process which goes on over years. Um, next, um, heart disease can't be prevented. Lifestyle changes, don't be afraid of medications when used appropriately. Next slide is just a joke. It says our menu is divided into three sections, cancer-causing foods, artery-clogging foods, and foods that are being boycotted for political or environmental reasons. <laughs> and pretty much so, what's left to eat, that brings home, you know, eat healthy, what does that mean? What does that mean? And next slide. So it's a now problem, and later may be too late. I've spoken enough, um, and just uh, offer any questions. <coughs>
the subway stands about, but if you could explain the relationship between the HDL and LDL, since you're talking about them as a tracker. Okay, story. good. So um, a lot of this, again, very political, very limited knowledge, which evolved over time. The question is, the HDL, good cholesterol, LDL, bad cholesterol. Cholesterol is cholesterol. There's no good cholesterol. We need cholesterol. Our bodies make cholesterol. Every cell will make its own cholesterol. Cholesterol is not an essential nutrient. There are certain foods we as human beings must consume or we die. Those are essential amino acids, which are proteins. Essential uh, fatty acids, you've heard of this. That's what omega-3s, omega-6s are. We need these special fats for production uh, or we die. No essential cholesterol. So now, if we don't have to eat cholesterol, you can eat a zero cholesterol diet and you're healthy. Yet, we need cholesterol. What does it tell you? It tells you the body makes its own cholesterol. Cholesterol, as I said, does not travel freely. It's attached to the particles. The HDL is the particle that presumably has cholesterol, but it's not being deposited in the arteries. It's being brought to the liver to be removed. And the LDL was thought to be the particle that has cholesterol that brings it into the artery wall, where we don't want it. So it's the same cholesterol. It's the good and bad particle we're really talking about, HDL, high-density lipoprotein particle. Now, where this breaks down is 50% of the people in the United States having a heart attack coming in have average or low LDL cholesterols. So if this is the marker of people at risk. We're clearly missing a lot of people at risk. And this goes, and we know this more and more over the last 30 years, because again, it's not the amount of cholesterol on the particles, it's the number of particles. And when we're measuring the LDL like you have, we're just measuring the amount of cholesterol in. So let me explain this quickly because I think it's important because you get these tests done with your doctors and most of the doctors wouldn't even understand this. Let's say you have an LDL of 100, you have an LDL of 100, I have an LDL of 100. That's an LDL cholesterol level of 100 which would be considered pretty good, okay? What we did was we took a test tube of blood from each of us, took the blood out, that's a deciliter, a tenth of a liter, shook it up, took out the LDL particles and measured the amount of cholesterol on those particles. You have 100 milligrams, you have 100 milligrams, I have 100 milligrams. That's the amount of cholesterol in our particles. But I may have one giant particle filled with 100 milligrams. You may have 10 particles filled with 10 milligrams, and you could have 100 little one milligram particles. We all three have an LDL of 100, but you've got these little suckers that are blasting your artery wall and causing inflammation. I got this big guy that floats around, too big to get into the artery wall. I've got an LDL of 100, I got clean arteries, you got an LDL of 100, you got plaque all over your body. So the LDL cholesterol breaks down to an individual. Those recommendations are based on populations, tens of thousands of people. So what we do is we can use certain techniques. There are blood tests, there are other cheats. This is kind of, I'm not here, just let you know, we're using profiles in our office. People come in and we can give them a better representation of what the particle count is. And that's a truer risk um, a marker. And what raises the particle count? What makes you having the 100 little particles me? That's where insulin comes in and carbohydrate come in. So carbohydrates, that's what I said, well, fat, I mean, um, um, sugar doesn't change your cholesterol. It doesn't change the amount of cholesterol. It packages it into the more dangerous types of particles. Mm -hmm. This is the next leap. So the HDL, LDL levels really to an individual don't tell us anything. You have to look at the total picture, the ratios, because the high carbohydrates tend to lower the HDL. I want to get into that a little bit. All the pharmaceutical-based tests, all the studies that have been done using statins, or LDL centric, so we do have data that statins, cholesterol pills, will lower your LDL and lower heart disease. No, they lower your LDL, they do. They also lower heart disease, but now we know the mechanism is different. Statins work by getting rid of the particles. Statins work by directly decreasing inflammation in the arteries. So now if you look at all our medical guidelines, a diabetic, if you're a 40 year old diabetic and you come in with a normal cholesterol, you know what you're going home with? A statin. Well, why would you give you a statin? Your cholesterol level is good. Because, you know, those in the living community, we now know it, the statins work. They do work to prevent heart disease, but not through cholesterol, only through a different mechanism. So we'll give you the pill anyway. So you're going to see this paradigm shift. The research is supported by the pharmaceutical industry. Now, I'm not saying that's bad. That's great. There's a lot of money that, you know, it's very expensive to do research trials. And the research data inherently is accurate. The pharmaceutical companies have to use these independent companies to make sure that they're not fudging the data. But they're set up to show their drug work. How they work, why they work, not really interested. They just want to show their drug works. Then the medical community has to come in and afterwards look at it and say, why did it work? And sometimes it's not what we think. So I would encourage you to, if your doctor says your cholesterol looks pretty good, you say, well, for who? For a 30-year-old marathon runner? For a 72-year-old guy who has high blood pressure? You want different cholesterol levels. 
What's my particle number? Do you have any way of assessing that? You don't have to do a blood test. There are other ways to look at it, but that's what you're really asking. Do I have the evidence of inflammation in my arteries beyond these blood tests? Because, you know, as I said, if you've had a heart attack, that's been going on 40 years. If you have an abnormal stress test, if you have um, placking in the artery, that's already a late stage. We want to get to these asymptomatic atherosclerotic patients earlier before they actually start developing narrowing, because that's when we can not only prevent the heart disease, but also the diabetes, the stroke, and everything else. So it's, it's evolving. It's evolving. It's exciting. Take time for one more question. Sure. Uh, vegetarians, they don't eat certain foods. Mm -hmm. How does this relate to heart disease? Okay, first place, the question is how do vegetarians eat certain foods? First place, a uh, vegetarian diet is not necessarily a, um, let me phrase that, I have a lot of fat vegetarians. Okay? If they really are heavily promoting a lot of the grains and stuff like that, pasta, they're overweight. So I have a lot of people, when I try vegetarian, and lose weight. Well, <coughs> that's in and of itself not important. But this is how I want to explain that. In the 1960s, they did this study called the, the, the Nurses' Heart Study in, in Massachusetts. Very interesting study. They just looked at about 20,000 20, nurses over time, filled out surveys. And one of the conclusions was, which I'm sure you've heard at some point in your life, vitamin E prevents heart disease. Have you ever heard vitamin E prevents heart disease? Okay, well, it's not now, but that's what we thought. Because they looked at nurses and they found that those who took vitamin E tended to have lower rates of heart disease. Vitamin E must prevent heart disease. When they went back years later, what did they look at? These were nurses in the 1960s taking vitamin E supplements. If they were taking vitamin E supplements, inherently they were more concerned with their health. They were healthier people. It wasn't the vitamin E, it was the fact that they took vitamin E that was a marker of these being healthier people. So getting back, if you're a healthy, fit person, if you're a young person, you're an athlete, you eat a vegetarian diet, you're fine. You can do it. You're probably not eating a lot of foods you could eat metabolically, but just as good, but that's a choice you make. But if you're a 240-pound person who wants to lose 30, 40 pounds, whose sugar might be up a little bit, who's good cholesterol is low and you're hypertensive, if you go on a vegetarian diet, I guarantee you, within three weeks, you'll be starving. You'll be craving food. And that's why they don't work. Your metabolism is different. You need the fat and protein to give your muscles energy. And when you don't take the fat and muscles, hunger kicks in. So the semi-starvation diets, and there's lots of semi-starvation diets, which is just lower calories. How are you portioning? They don't work after a while. They always work for a few weeks. You're motivated. Then hunger kicks in. So the real way to eat is to get, if you're overweight, is to get rid of the foods that promote insulin, because insulin is the hormone that stores food. You get rid of your insulin, you start burning your belly fat, your muscles are bathed with energy, and you, you feel great, you lose weight. The knock on that, it, it's a high fat, high protein diet. It's really not, you don't have to eat fat, but you can. It's not that fat's great for you, it's that it's not bad for you. It's a different spin on what Atkins, I believe. Although Atkins was right for the wrong reasons. Um, <laughs> but the knock on it was that, well, you're gonna gain weight, you're eating fat, it's gonna lead to heart disease. It doesn't. Because I have a series of hundreds of patients now who have done this, and when you look at the lipoprotein particle number, it plummets when you stay away from the carbohydrate. And it's remarkable. So the markers we were using for disease for 30, 40 years are great. Again, you have 10,000 people, you're going to see more heart attacks and high cholesterol. <coughs> but the assumption was was fat that led to that problem, and that problem led to the heart disease. It's not. The LDL is a marker of something else going on. And if you don't treat the other thing going on, that, it wasn't, that wasn't a direction of my question. My question was, they don't eat meat. So no. how do they get the protein to su support them? Because the vegetarians I've seen Beans have tons of protein. very low muscle mass and they're very normal. No, not always. Those are the healthy ones you notice. Again, okay. I have lots of fat vegetarians. I okay. can get a vegetarian. <laughs> you can get nutrition disorders. But the bottom line is, no, no, you don't have to eat meat. Meat's a great source of lots of stuff. You don't have to eat any meat. protein. Beans it's have proteins, nuts have proteins, okay. uh, there's, you know, fish have proteins if they can eat fish. Um, having said that, when you look at the vegans who eat no animal I mean, fish products, they have, they have, they're seeing tons of uh, nutrition deficiencies. That was, I should And they have to take tons of supplements and stuff. It's really not a very balanced diet. That was fine. Why was Atkins right? Atkins in, in the mid-1970s was one of many who was railing against our government getting involved in this and saying we should stay away from fat. Atkins was one of many who recognized that if you go through the history of the previous 100 years, when the British Empire would colonize, would colonize an area, heart disease went up. You know, Eskimos eat zero plant products. Mm -hmm. Their natural diet, none, not one thing from the ground. It's pure fish and seal and whey. They have no heart disease. They have no cholesterol problems whatsoever. Man, you know, civilization comes in with bushels of flour and sugar. Ten years later, they got big bellies and cavities and, and <coughs> strokes and heart disease. And this is true everywhere. So he was one of many who recognized that it's carbohydrates that cause the problem. And by the way, again, I'm not here to 
pontificate, but in 1945, this was lost. Up until 1945, if you look at all the nutritional and weight loss, it was all carbohydrates. It was, and they knew it. Who were fat people? To wealthy people. You know, I mean, it was really, uh, you know, people ate a lot of breads and having, all right. That data was lost because most of it was German data. And after World War II, we wanted the physicists. We weren't really interested in the nutritional sciences. And then we start all over again, wrong in the 50s. So going back, Atkins said that fats are great. You have to eat fat. Don't touch a carbohydrate because it's sugar. And the Atkins diet, which I still to this day have patients who struggle with diets, and the best they ever felt and the best they ever did was with the Atkins. He said you have to eat bacon and eggs in the morning, steaks at lunch, everything. So his message was fat's really good for you. The problem was, in reality, is two things. You can eat fat, but you don't have to eat fat. You don't have to eat steak. Is that the carbs are bad for you? So he was telling you to eat fat. There are people that just, I can't eat another steak. I can't eat another egg. But the real issue, it's not carbohydrates that are evil. It's insulin. So there are many carbohydrates, like broccoli, which is sugar, but it's got so much fiber in it, the fiber doesn't let you absorb the sugar. So it's not spiking insulin. So for example, Atkins would have said, no fruits and vegetables, no nuts. The right way to eat is to eat all the nuts you want. You can eat fibrous fruits and vegetables to your heart's content. And that's a big difference, for example, where he was wrong. Secondly, Atkins um, thought that, um, uh, as I said, fat promotes uh, health. It doesn't promote health. It doesn't hurt your health. It's a, it's a different spin there. I'll give you, I'll give you an example. Uh, again, I, I hope, you know, cut me off if you want. But for many people think that I'm just going to start exercising and I'm going to lose weight. Okay? And the thought was, well, I stopped exercising, that's why I gained weight. It's actually not true. It's a shift. When you have the metabolism we're talking about. You actually store energy, like I said. So you, you can eat 100 calories of something, I can eat 100 calories of something, it's all going to your belly, it's going to my muscles. So I'm running around doing stuff, and you're just sitting there like this. So it's more than just what, how, how much we eat, it's what we're doing with what we eat. So you don't stop eating, you don't stop exercising and gain weight. You start gaining weight, and then you stop exercising. Because all your energy is going here, there's nothing left for you to exercise. It's a different spin on what's going on. It's taking the blame off the person who's overweight. It's taking the blame off. It's not willpower. Willpower is a cookie there, I don't want it. But people who have this metabolism, where they're storing energy, they have insulin, that body's craving it. They need that energy. They, they, they need it. And, and skinny people who don't have the metabolism can't relate to it. So a little bit of a shift on where we're going. It's not It's your body craving, and you can shift it. That's the difference. And that's why these diets don't work, because they're not I'm not identifying that. Dr. Fiabra, I want to thank you okay, for the most educational half hour.